Hi, I'm Bob, and welcome to episode 4 of my ongoing series, Attack of the Rhetoric, where I would like to start a discussion about parallels between the Star Wars movie franchise and world literature, philosophy, and history. Star Wars is a really fantastic cultural phenomenon, and it's a lot of fun to use the saga as a springboard to appreciate the themes, concepts, and illusions that permeate and impact our modern culture. Please keep in mind, however, that I don't presume to know what creator George Lucas was thinking when he wrote the movies. I only want to know what all of you were thinking when you watched them. Today, I'd like to start off by talking about names. Names like Darth Maul and Han Solo can allow insight into the nature of the characters that own them, but what about other names? The following is a salute and a tribute to the biggest name in history's biggest franchise, Darth Vader. The difficulty with a saga set a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away is that the author can't come right out and say an everyday word or name associated with a familiar motif. The illusions have to be buried so as not to draw attention to themselves and ruin the immersion. That's why I believe Lucas drops so many hints through the names of people and places. One thing that a lot of people have speculated about is the fact that the Dutch word Vater means father. So the immediate assumption would be that Lucas was hinting to the audience that Darth Vader was the protagonist's progenitor from the very beginning, or at least hinting to the Dutch-speaking audience. It's possible that Vader is a derivative of Invader in the same way Sidious could be a derivative of Insidious, but that seems a bit shallow to me. Then there's always the possibility that Darth Vader is simply a nonsensical appellative, but that would be inconsistent with the aforementioned Darth Maul and Darth Tyrannus, which have fairly obvious connotations. The problem with the theory is that Dutch is a relatively obscure language, and some detractors are doubtful whether Lucas had originally intended Vader to be Luke's father when he wrote A New Hope. However, the interpretation of the name as father is fairly intriguing when you consider that Anakin reputedly had no father at all. Some people have expressed annoyance at the idea of Darth Vader starting out as a cherubic waif exclaiming endearing little expletives like, Yippee! My best guess is that Yippee is too innocent and childlike to be uttered by the future Dark Lord of the Sith. Uh, some people seem to feel that Anakin should have burst forth from the ravaged loins of his mother, breathing fire and choking puppies. Perhaps that would have been best if Anakin were meant to be beyond redemption, if the pre-existing arc of the story had not been chiefly concerned with the salvation of Vader's forced ghost. The fact remains, however, uh, that you cannot effect a redemption without first having fallen from grace. That's why the cheery exclamation is actually central to the character. Uh, without that yulp that was symbolic of Anakin's integrity, the entire saga would have been flaccid redundancy. It's important to establish a clear and ironic contrast as Anakin having once been the polar opposite of his future self. Uh, that's the stuff of legend. Well, Anakin is certainly legendary or mythic, he is not an allegorical character, static and unchanging, which is why he can appeal to the audience. He is a dynamic character defined by his progress, regress as an individual. Um, in the introduction to A Clockwork Orange, the author Anthony Burgess writes, The quality of genuine fiction is an art founded on the principle that human beings change. If Anakin had not been a free-spirited and benevolent child, then the saga would have been robbed of virtually all elements of tragedy, and dramatic tragedy is what keeps audiences coming back. Uh, what leaves us with a feeling of an eternal and internal conflict. Yippee is like Anakin's desperate cry, look at me, I'm pure iconic imagery. If we take the Star Wars saga as a whole, as the story of Anakin Skywalker, it's a rare case that the hero and villain should be the same person. Not that there's only one hero and one villain, but the arc of the story is such that Anakin emerges as the primary protagonist in the beginning, and then becomes the primary antagonist until his redemption at the very end. But is Darth Vader really a villain? Anakin begins as purely heroic, he gives without thought of reward. However, the strain of ethical idealism against a uh, hostile, unheroic, corrupt society brings out 
not necessarily villainy as one might expect, but anti-heroism. Luke Skywalker of the original trilogy is unquestionably the perfected romantic hero in the traditional mythic sense, and despite the inevitable confusion, the non-chronological storytelling is appropriate for the progression of our present society. Uh, I'd like to show how the journey of Anakin Skywalker turned Darth Vader is an important renovation of the monomyth. From a narrative standpoint, this is an attempt to make our fictional or mythic archetypes function in an increasingly pessimistic culture. The problem is nothing, says celebrated mythologist Joseph Campbell, if not that of rendering the modern world spiritually significant. I say pessimistic only so much as the starry-eyed naivety of infinite perfectibility dwindles in the face of world war, global pollution, energy crisis, and the trend of moral relativism relaxing into amorality. As a potent symbol for capable realism, the anti-hero archetype helps psychologically to reconcile the romantic hero uh, battling all odds against tyrannical gods or godlike tyrants with the nihilistic, scientific ambiguity of our postmodern society. The anti-hero's hesitation to live up to the heroic ideal makes their attempts at base revenge simply create new crimes to be punished in a series of sympathetic or justifiable wrongs. Anti-heroes, being somewhat rare, are by no means unique. There is a word for tragic characters that are of a dark, brooding, anti-heroic nature. Byronic. Byronic is defined as possessing the characteristics of Lord Byron or his poetry, especially romanticism, melancholy, and melodrama. Neither Lucas nor Byron was the first to invent such a character, but Byron characterizes the character, not only in his writing, but in his life. I don't in any way mean to suggest Lucas was trying to present Anakin Skywalker as a Byronic hero. I'm only saying the character could be accurately referred to as such. I'm just going to quote some lines from Byron's work, and you can glean on your own the worthiness of the comparison. Famously described by one of his lovers as mad, bad, and dangerous to know, Lord Byron resembles Anakin in the aspect of his rise in social status, wit, good looks, early talent, and notorious ennui. All of this comes through in his writing. For starters, compare these lines from the Jower with the image of young, unrequited Anakin, and also with his reaction to the death of his mother. Though young and pale, that sallow front is scathed by fiery passion's brunt. Admittedly, the situations are quite different, but the general description is remarkably similar. For further development, think of when Padme begins to accept Anakin's affection in Episode 2, and they are discussing their political views and the irony they contain. Also remember the offer Vader makes Padme near the end of Episode 3, and to his son Luke in Episode 4. And stern to the haughty, but humble to thee, the soul in its bitterest blackness shall be, and our days seem as swift, and our moments more sweet, with thee by my side than with worlds at our feet. What's important here is that instead of pleading to join their noble causes, he seeks to impose his ideas on them. The irony is that his world outlook has been corrupted by the dark side, and he has lost any true sense of purpose. Returning to the Jower, we can see an image of Anakin turning his back on his childhood admiration of the Jedi and their ways of passiveness and reflection. As Palpatine says, Anakin has been searching for a life above that of an ordinary Jedi, a life of significance. He is an angelic child turned angst-ridden teenager, exalting in his abilities, but fulminating his teacher's pacing, then going so far as to commit atrocities to achieve his goals. My days, though few, have passed below, in much of joy, but more of woe. Now leagued with friends, now girt by foes, I loathed the languor of repose. I'd rather be the thing that crawls most noxious o'er a dungeon's walls than pass my dull, unvarying days condemned to meditate and gaze. And I shall sleep without a dream of what I was and would be still, dark as to thee my deeds may seem. A bit further in the poem are words that summarize the climax of episode three. The maid I love, 
the man I hate, and I will hunt the steps of fate to save or slay as these require through rending steel and rolling fire. Again, the setting and circumstances are different, but a portrait of the Byronic character emerges. It's in the drama Manfred that the true Byronic character has its origin. Manfred is a man haunted by guilt. Uh, the cause of the guilt is never explicitly revealed, but it has to do with his great love Astarte, who it is implied he murdered or otherwise caused the death of. Much like Anakin, who is told in his anger had killed Padme. Toward the end, when Manfred is confronted by spirits seeking to take him to his ultimate fate, he is defiant of all attempts at condemnation or redemption until he finally gives up willingly. Compare these lines to the newly christened Darth Vader on the cusp of a lava river, cut to pieces, cursing his mentor. I do defy ye, though I feel my soul is ebbing from me, yet I do defy ye. Nor will I hence, while I have earthly breath, to breathe my scorn upon ye, earthly strength, to wrestle, though with spirits. What you take shall be taken limb by limb. At this point, you may be asking yourself, what exactly is the difference between a villain and an anti-hero? The obvious answer is not much. For the sake of this video, I have suggested a few dissimilarities, but it would require a whole other presentation to really compare and contrast the two. Villains use pawns like Jar Jar Binks and Sifo Dyas, whereas anti-heroes tip allies like R2-D2 or Boba Fett, uh, or an attempted recruitment of Luke. Villains have inverted ideals in direct opposition to the protagonist. Anti-heroes have distorted but noble or somewhat compatible goals. Villains are almost always more powerful than the hero or have an uncontrollable lust for more power. Anti-heroes are sometimes powerless but are more often highly skilled or trained. Villains are fickle and gratuitous in the wrongs they commit and delight in their own cruelty. Antiheroes, on the other hand, are usually very utilitarian, questionably justifying their actions. Antiheroes are generally very cynical, and their lack of purpose allows them to become subservient to a more powerful will. A villain uh, may justify his actions, but the audience understands he is committed to a set of false or immoral precepts that he is incapable of reforming. This allows villains to be remorseless in the pursuit of their goals, and their goals are usually just an excuse for the loathsome and irredeemable actions. The anti-hero, though, is more conflicted about his obligations due to his inability to commit to a worldview, and this makes his actions inconsistent but characteristically likable. And so every one of us shares the supreme ordeal, carries the cross of the Redeemer, not in the bright moments of his tribe's great victories, but in the silences of his personal despair. Titan, to thee strife was given, between the suffering and the will, which torture where they cannot kill, and the inexorable heaven, and the deaf tyranny of fate, the ruling principle of hate, which for its pleasure doth create the things it may annihilate. To me, these few lines are enough to demonstrate the qualities of a Byronic character, but I don't believe the subject is nearly exhausted. I hope you enjoyed this tribute to my favorite anti-hero, and will look forward to the next episode in my series, Attack of the Rhetoric. Let me leave you with the final lines of Lord Byron's poem, The Jower, which could easily be the end lines of Return of the Jedi. Save what the father must not say, who shrived him on his dying day. This broken tale was all we knew, of her he loved, or him he slew. Thanks for watching.